Slack is a, a center of excellence in AI and machine learning at uh, McKinsey & Company. Um, we are focused on building uh, machine learning models and leveraging them uh, to really improve businesses and drive uh, their performance. Um, so we have offices uh, um, around the, the world with perhaps the major hub uh, still in London. And this is exactly where uh, Daniel and I are joining from. We will be joined by our colleague um, based in um, Brussels, Pascal. Um, and yeah, like today uh, we wanted to share with you uh, some of our learnings uh, from the last few months in terms of challenges and opportunities uh, that we faced when we're building data science solutions uh, with LLMs. So um, like really excited to be here. Daniel, perhaps, uh, would you like to introduce yourself before we begin? Oh, of course. So, hi, Daniel, uh, data scientist at Quantiflex in the London office, um, originally physics PhD. And yeah, really excited to work now on LLMs and actually bring them to clients. Wonderful. Just in time. <laughs> time indeed. Thanks for joining us. You're joining us from Brussels, right? I didn't lie. Uh, Amsterdam. Yeah, sorry. Amsterdam. I was still in the Zoom room. <laughs> in from. the backstage area. Wonderful. No worries at all. Um, so, yeah, um, today we wanted to talk to um, uh, our lovely audience about the challenges and opportunities um, that we faced when building data science solutions with LLMs. And uh, we represent our strong community that is, of course, very excited about all the latest advances in uh, large language models, well, in Gen AI in general. Um, and of course, um, things are moving really fast. And sometimes it's really hard to stay up to date with what's going on. And um, things really... Um, um, sometimes feel like they get out of hand. So we really wanted to focus today on um, things such as risk and compliance and all the important guardrails that need to be in place when we actually start um, deploying these models and start bringing value to the end users. Um, so Pascal, uh, perhaps uh, given your background, and uh, I would also uh, love you to uh, say a few words about your uh, yeah, your, your background before you joined QB and uh, at QB. Um, yeah, like we would want to hear a bit more about um, how uh, software engineering developments and innovations that happened in, in the last few months affected um, the trends that we see in using LLMs um, and in, in building data science solutions with LLMs. So, of course, you know, um, for a long time, LLMs um, really had a very high entrance bar and uh, were really a matter of a few lucky ones. Uh, but now we see that uh, the applications are, are really rising every single day and like, it feels like they're growing exponentially. And of course, um, a lot of um, this acceleration is really uh, enabled by uh, APIs that are now exposed and um, that would be Really interesting to see your take on how other innovations are really um, affecting this democratization of technology. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll I'll just share a little bit of like how we approached it. So essentially, uh, a couple months back, I think the whole world got overrun by uh, ChatGPT essentially, and it was in everybody's uh, on everyone's mind. Um, I think the moment when your parents-in-law start chatting with you through translations from ChatGPT and your fitness trainer um, just says, okay, today's class was ChatGPT based. Um, you realize it's mainstream. And it kind of reminded me of this, um, a couple of these memes back in the in the blockchain hype days, where it's like when your taxi driver is asking you what the latest is on blockchain, then you know it's time to, to jump ship. Um, and so I just realized or we all realize, like, okay, we have to get involved here. Um, and um, then I applied a little bit of my my data engineering background, which like I, I built two or three years of, of data platforms and 
uh, have a lot of Kubernetes experience. Um, and we looked at what was out there on the on the cloud providers. So this is like Q4 last year. Um, and we very quickly hit the boundaries. So if you look at GCP, it wasn't possible to host these large models. They're just too large. So Vertex didn't support it. SageMaker, there wasn't really anything there. Um, Azure also wasn't, it wasn't yet so clear how deeply integrated Microsoft and, uh, and OpenAI are going to be. So we realized, okay, there's definitely not, not anything out of the box. Um, and so let's apply what we know, which is let's use Kubernetes. Let's see how big the machines need to be. Um, and then let's try and containerize it and bring it into a world where we can apply our existing knowledge around machine uh, MLOps and uh, hosting, let's say, normal machine learning models or smaller ones um, and get them to work. Uh, and so we looked at frameworks like uh, Selden and um, McKinsey also has uh, recently acquired Iguazio. So we also looked at that. Um, but we then again hit this, this threshold of, well, it doesn't actually fit on a single instance because some of these models were so large, we couldn't fit them on a single Kubernetes node. Um, and so while all of the tools were there, they weren't meant to handle 300 gigabyte models because of course, uh, Daniel and I instantly wanted to load the largest blue model because why wouldn't you start with the largest one? Because then everything else um, becomes easy afterwards. Uh, yeah, and so like we en actually ended up making everything work. We used Ray in the end because Ray allowed us to uh, cluster across multiple nodes and spread the spread the model across different instances. And it also just felt more mature because Ray comes from the same people that came up with Spark, and Spark just became so democratized or democratized big data so much, it felt like a right move. So we switched to Ray and got the blue model running there. Um, and then also looked at other models and got some of those running. And so now this is two and a half months ago and I feel like it's completely obsolete because somebody ported everything to C++ and then colleagues send me pictures of them playing around with Bloom on their iPhone. Um, and so like, if I just take a step back now, I realize we probably don't need the complexity of Kubernetes anymore. Vertex just announced that they are gonna have LLM support SageMaker didn't really make a big fuss of it, but they also support it now. Uh, Azure supports it now. Um, the models become much more tameable again because uh, people are showing that seven to nine billion models are also super useful. And um, the space is moving so quickly that it's actually really fun to see that code that you thought was a really good idea two months ago and soft infrastructure that you've built two months ago uh, you can pretty much get rid of because you can stand on the shoulders of giants from Google and uh, Amazon and not handle a Kubernetes cluster because ultimately that's just a lot of work for, for very little benefit. So yeah, that was kind of our, our journey over the last three months. Um, you know, it was still very good to learn because we learned about all of the infrastructure challenges that you have when you're trying to make these things work and you're trying to provide sufficiently large uh, GPU workbenches um, trying to bring these models in a way that you can scale them up and have auto scaling. Scale to zero is very difficult. Um, but then I think taking a step back again, realizing to build a product, it's not necessarily to pick the coolest technology, but just to get the job done. And turns out chances are the you know, uh, hyperscalers are going to be able to, to help us a lot with these things. Thanks, Pascal, for your perspective. This is very helpful. Daniel, yeah, given that uh, you were also one of the newcomers, do you want to comment on uh, your experience? Also, given that you're coming from a bit of a different background, uh, uh, how was that for you? Um, I have to say the journey in the last few months was uh, super exciting. So I think one of the use cases that really stood out um, on our side was the whole topic of uh, document-based question answering. So I've been starting to play with this um, in the second half of the last year. So just putting together some small prototypes. Nowadays, in pretty much every industry, so uh, from finance, sustainability, over healthcare, education, you name it, people do face the problems that they have to ingest huge amounts of information. And usually they are looking for some very specific insights from, you know, a range of documents, structured data sources, you name it. So 
one of the tools that really stood out and were the most really exciting development happening in the last few months is Langchain. Um, by the way, congratulations if anyone is here on the call to, you know, raising this 10 million seed round. And the part that most people are getting really excited about is that it allows you to take these but ChatGPT, which is already really, really good at answering questions from a wide range of general problems to really tailor it to the specific problem domain. Also, another big advantage is that by providing these sources, you reduce the hallucinations. And on top of it, you have the chance to uh, validate the model outputs and cost check them. So that's the topic that we also was excited about at the moment. Uh, yeah. And Daniel, for you as a data scientist, um, did you feel that um, all these new libraries that popped up and um, were like developed by the community really helped to democratize access to LLMs um, and not only to the data practitioners, but also to the wider population? Um, I would say it definitely unlocks a lot of capabilities that, you know, most people wouldn't really have seen uh, two years ago. I guess uh, people who were working already previously saw what's possible with GPT-3, got early access to the APIs, uh, were aware of what can be done, but you're currently seeing it, yeah, I don't know, it's a mass market, especially thanks to the hype generated around ChatGPT. Um, one minute. Um, do we maybe briefly go to the comments we are seeing here? So there's a question for Pascal. Uh, could you please share the list of tools you used in the last few projects? And a second question about the infrastructure challenges. Any specific ideas and tools helped you to fine tune the beast, I guess, that would mean biggest models? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, so the first one, um, we tried to stay pretty cloud agnostic because um, in general, it felt like if you if you can somehow get into the Kubernetes world, then it doesn't matter if you're on-premise, uh, whether you have um, a, a cluster in one of the hyperscalers, and you can imagine that also a lot of the very large enterprises, uh, which are often McKinsey clients, are... Um, they tend to have still a fair bit amount of on-premise stuff. Um, and that's actually a super interesting world in which it's fun to, uh, to apply this technology because um, when you have all of this knowledge that's kind of locked up in some on-premise systems, making that available, of course, is super attractive. But um, what seems to be a bit of a pattern there is you bring the data to the model or do you bring the model to the data? And it, I think a lot of companies actually prefer bringing the model to their own data rather than sending all of their data to some other company. Uh, and so we went for Kubernetes and then um, I think stayed, that open, stayed with that open source stack. So Kubernetes, Prometheus, Grafana, Loki for all of the like, you know, non-functional tooling. And then um, let's say on the, on the LLM stack, it was really Kubernetes. Um, of course, making sure the GPU uh, are or the GPUs are available for the pods, and then um, we had Ray um, or a Ray cluster running on top of Kubernetes um, because it then allows us to apply or to deploy a model across different nodes. And we uh, used Alpa in the end, which um, was I don't even know when Alpa was released um, to get the very large models running, mm, and then. I think for the second part, like what the um, what the challenges. Wait. Okay. Um, for the for the fine tooling of the beast models. Yeah, perhaps yeah. Daniel, you could also comment on that. Yeah, Daniel, do you do you actually think what we used is still applicable? Because I feel like I just want to get into the new tools that were released over the last, like Deep Speed. I want to get involved in, or I want to um, try. Yeah, to. Deep Speed uh, was a useful tool, so that made it really, really accessible. Mm -hmm. Also, we see, uh, you know, uh, accelerated integration from Hugging Face. I'm really, really excited about trying out uh, DeepSpeed Chat 
Um, so I was just uh, like yesterday or today in the morning looking at the performance figures that they gave on, you know, what kind of machines you can use to fine tune uh, of the DB model. And hey, you can do it on one instance, 8A100, spend a day or a weekend on it. That sounded very, very promising. Yeah. yeah. Some, some more questions uh, specifically on the Bloom project here from the chat. So any, any thoughts on that, Daniel? Um, that was, of course, one of the uh, few large language model options uh, generally available that you can run in your own environment and fine tune to specific purposes. So, yes, yeah. we used it for that. I think, I think uh, fine tuned it. Yeah. A lot of the world used um, Llama, right? Because that was, or a lot of, let's say, a lot of the people that publish online. Um, because they're just doing it for research, they all use Llama. And so that seemed to, over the last month and a half or so, make the most progress, anything that's kind of a Llama derivative. But if you do anything commercial, you can't use it. All of the meta models are untouchable, essentially. And so Bloom was the only one that was really feasible. And now I think Databricks came around with uh, Dolly. So I'm also very keen to look into that, because can we now use the innovations that we've seen over the last month and a half with Alpaca, et cetera, Apply that to uh, apply that to Dolly and see, can we maybe do a fine-tuned model that is specific to a to a domain, like an insurance document specific model or something that um, I'm, I'm pretty sure most people know, like the the medical literature fine-tuned models. I think that's super interesting to see. Yeah, yeah indeed. So before we move to the next question from the chat, I wanted to address um, another question to Pascal. So uh, yeah, we see that. Indeed, as you mentioned, the space is moving so fast. Uh, God knows what's going to come out in the next week and how this is going to change our ways of working. Uh, so perhaps uh, it would be interesting to get your view on the existing limitations that you still see in terms of the infra um, and tech architecture, and perhaps you know, like the big breakthrough that you believe could help us overcome these limitations. Um. I actually, I'm, I'm getting really positive or becoming really positive about it because I feel like um, we're getting to the point where if you just want inference, like I think we have like these three stages, right? If you just want inference, that's pretty simple at this point. You want to fine tune that's harder, but still pretty doable. And then if you want to train from scratch, of course, that's complete, completely different beast. Um, but just the inference bit, we're getting back to the point where it's it almost feels like just another model. They're larger, but um, the platforms are adapting pretty quickly and they're making it feasible. So then I think the major part of work is not actually going to be the LLM, but it's going to be all of the other engineering that we already know for a while. It's just, it takes time. Um, if you want to do question answering like Daniel referred to, well, you need to have a vector store and that vector store needs to be integrated and you need to have some form of um, process flow, okay, the user asks a question, you want to enrich that question with additional context. Now you send it off to the LLM. You want to keep your uh, risk and ethics checks uh, involved there as well. So you need some kind of um, process flow that organizes all of this. And that's classic software engineering requirements, um, which I think we'll now again see that, you know, there's, there's the entire complexity of building a product and then the model is just one small little piece. It's an old image that has been used for a while, but I think we're going to come back to this where LLM is just a small model in this larger bucket of thinking about the product, thinking about your um, the technology stack, where's the data? If you can't, if you, if you don't even have access to your own data because it sits in so many silos, then it's very difficult to bring it into this one vector store. Indeed, indeed, and it almost feels like uh, you know, with with um, very very similar to what happened to data science um, when MLOps became a thing, it's gonna yeah, like the new advances in Gen AI are gonna disrupt uh, the skill set that data scientists and machine learning engineers need to have. So, uh, would you would you like to share your perspective on um, what you would you would um, recommend data scientists and data engineers to develop uh, as a skill set um, as we move forward. 
Daniel, do you want to do the data science first? Um, I think we have a call of engineers here. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, from my perspective, like data engineers need to be again more and more software engineers. Um, I, I often have this feeling like if you if you talk to people, what is a data engineer? You either have the camp of former software engineers and now just do a lot of data work. And then you have the second camp, which is I write SQL queries and um, Spark code. And I think that second part, that might not necessarily be the most significant uh, skill set anymore. But the first part of bringing a, a large complex software engineering uh, project together and connecting to all of the different software syst uh, data systems and bringing those data um, assets into one place and making them available for the LLM. That's something I would focus on. And definitely look into like vector databases are so such a curious new kid on the block that I haven't learned about in university. And now it's so obvious, like why wasn't this always a clear database style or paradigm that everybody always talked about? Indeed. Thank you, Pascal. Yeah. Yeah, uh, please, Daniel, go ahead. And I think this is also a nice segue to our next uh, set of questions. Of course. Uh, so on the data science side, I have to say, compared to traditional uh, machine learning, where it's usually straightforward, OK, you have your R squared, and now you're trying to optimize for it by adding features to the hyperparameter tuning. Sometimes uh, the whole prompt engineering, et cetera, feels much more like a soft science. So when you're only a consumer of these large language models. Um, in general, the question of how to evaluate the quality of the output in a structured way is a bit of a tricky one. And I haven't seen a good off the shelf solution for that yet. And other than that, I think it's a very, very new field. So you have really a chance to be creative and come up with new use cases that get unlocked with well, large language models. So yeah. Um, should I also pick up the uh, value and cost of tokens question or should we do uh, that then? So yeah, let's, let's perhaps leave it to the end. I just really wanted us to talk a bit more about um, an actual um, example of the application. And um, yeah, perhaps Daniel could share a use case um, that we've, um, we've worked on uh, at TB. And what exactly it takes, right, like to build a solution end to end. So Pascal started describing the flow, but it would be very interesting to hear from your perspective on yeah, what exactly needs to be built to make this whole machinery work. Yeah, of course. Um, let's maybe stick with this um, lang chain question answering example. Um, the foundation, uh, well, the foundation model, as the name already says. Um, in the next step, needs to be enriched with uh, the additional data stores, as Pascal just outlined. So set up your vector database, ingest all the relevant data, make sure the permissions, etc., are appropriate. Potentially, um, depending on, you know, if you chose the API consumption or self-hosting -host route, you might have to tailor the model a little bit. So for the problem domain, for the use case. On top of it, there's a few other layers that you have to build. You need to build the whole infrastructure to gather feedback from the users so you actually have a chance to uh, iteratively improve your models. You have to put in place actually a good amount of risk infrastructure, both on the input side, so when users ask the questions, so you don't have, or, so you're reducing the likelihood of uh, do anything now moments. And also a review of the outputs to make sure that, uh, you know, especially if it's well, available to a wider range of people in the organization or externally, uh, the output is again filtered. And then, yeah, you have to build, think about the whole UX perspective, UI perspective, especially if you're thinking about use cases that are going beyond, hey, I want to put a chatbot on my website just a little bit better. So if we double down on this question of uh, validating and evaluating the answers, which of course in the case of um, textual data becomes much trickier than just like checking performance of your model where it's just R squared or AUC or whatnot, um, can you share any 
thoughts about how that can be um, improved, automated, accelerated, and yeah, if, if you have any um, any learnings that you could share with the audience. I would say there's uh, two or three potential avenues that you can take. Um, you can try to go with the source attribution and automatic validation. You can try to use the fact that the underlying models are probabilistic and not just generate a text, but rather likelihoods for different outputs. And potentially, it's also possible to uh, move towards more automated evaluation methods. So thinking about the approach that is taken in reinforcement learning from human feedback with a small uh, critic model. Now, of course, this is all still you know, rapidly evolving at the moment. Yeah. Pascal, perhaps you, you could also share your perspective on um, yeah, how you see that part of the whole flow in this solution be further automated and, uh, and improved. Um. Yeah, but if you if you don't mind, so Daniel just or Daniel's uh, description, particularly in regards to the risks, um, made me think a little bit because I know that, or most of us I guess know that OpenAI invested very heavily in aligning the model and making sure that it behaves in a certain way, not in other ways. Whereas these raw models, of course, have not gone through this kind of alignment process as much, and so. In theory, um, as we have more and more of these open source models available um, and deployed all over the place, we have to replicate all of these risk safeguards again and again and again. Um, and so I was just imagining all these different organizations having their own model that can do all of the or will do all of these things that we've seen with Bing initially, where Bing um, just says, I'm tired of answering your questions and ask me something intelligent, please. Um, but then I also wonder, is this just a phase where for a while we're all going to have a lot of fun um, breaking these models out of their out of their cages? But then at some point it just becomes boring because ultimately I think then we've all tried it once, just like we've sent memes on WhatsApp. Um, but then at some point it's just a tool and we all become a, bit, a little bit more mature about it and just get on with our lives. And, um, use it for the problem that we're trying to solve. I don't know, what's your, th you, you shake your head, Daniel. Yeah, let's see, I think uh, the human nature of trying to break things and getting unintended reaction is not gonna go away anytime soon. Yeah, true. Yeah, but, there, yeah. I don't know if there's any good tools or frameworks in, in regards to risk and compliance that I would feel like are a drop-in solution and just take care of it for you. That's probably something interesting to watch. Yeah, I think this is very interesting because, you know, like even before Gen AI, Gen AI um, was a thing um, in traditional ML and AI, it took us years to come up with some frameworks, like not just the general framework, but some frameworks around risk governance and compliance and ethics um, to monitor and like have some ideas on, yeah, indeed, you know, our models are prone to be biased and uh, we need to actually do something about it. So I believe, yeah, given the, the, the pace at which this technology is evolving, like we definitely need to move faster, but I have a feeling based on um, how that's been so far, it's going to take us, you know, like months, that month, if, if not years. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like um, it, this is very interesting that you mentioned that, of course, like as part of the uh, validation part and definitely a layer of risk and compliance is uh, extremely important and especially when you start working in the organizations with their internal data this is becoming even more important um, and uh, yeah perhaps I'd just like to finish it off um, Daniel could you share some of your experiences with, um, with, with the organizations and how they approach uh, how open they are to these kind of systems I would say it's uh, a lot of enthusiasm at the moment uh, to use, uh, you know, Gen AI, mainly inspired by ChatGPT. One of the biggest challenges is to manage the expectations. Since it's cool to go to the website, you enter something, you get a response, but of course it still needs to be integrated. As we just described, there's still a lot of steps to go through. 
um, maybe also on the risk side of using these tools. I think at least in the beginning, it's a good idea to have humans somewhere in the loop, especially uh, when it comes to uh, the outputs that are being used downstream in process that might affect individuals. So I wouldn't completely go 100% automation yet. And yeah, I'm not sure which direction did you want to go, Victoria? Um, I actually believe that uh, this is, yeah, we went full circle uh, in the model and uh, I would actually want to pick up some questions from the chat. Uh, so I see some of the questions already dropped here, um, specifically for Daniel. So the one I'm going to read out loud. I'm also playing with long chain and also baby AGI. Okay, good start. I wonder how do you think it can be used for commercial? These kinds of tools require generating lots of tokens and can be really costly. So yeah, let's discuss the cost part of it. Um, actually, that's an interesting point. Yes, it costs a bit of money to use the large language models. And in the beginning, I would have expected, okay, to get a good answer, um, you're gonna pay, let's say, a dollar per question. Now, uh, a few weeks later, there was an announcement, yeah, we are having a GPT 3.5 Turbo and the cost are reduced by a factor 10. And, you know, suddenly you move to 10 cent and you're like, oh, okay, that's a good price. With probably further reductions uh, coming in the future when more providers are coming on the market with comparable models and models become more efficient. Um, also, I would say commercially, yes, it costs you, I mean, worst case, let's say, a dollar to answer a question. But if to get to the similar answer, you would have a human spend half an hour going through multiple, multiple documents, control Fing, and then writing up the answer. Um, actually, that might be a dollar very well spent. So it really depends on the use case that you're exploring. I would assume the economics would be very different if you're running a public facing website and you're trying to finance uh, the service that you're providing only with ads. In that case, the cost of compute might, of course, play a bigger role. Actually, the ads question is going to be an interesting one because the whole ad business of the internet is currently being challenged. So, you know, how much can you rely on an ad-based business model of a website to, to solve your problem if the technology that you're now leveraging is actually challenging that ad business model in the first place. What do you think about that one? I don't have a qualified opinion on that. <laughs> Just time to form it. Um, thank I you. Like, I think I like the point, like, um, never underestimate your the value of your own time. If it saves you 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes you can have quality life and go for a walk. I think that's probably worth a euro for most people. Yeah. That's a great philosophical spin on it, Pascal. Um, so yes, next question to you then. Uh, I imagine that European companies, especially in finance or defense, are super hesitant to use US cloud providers or US-based API services given the US Cloud Act. Um, so I don't see the second half of the question, but yeah, I, I believe that there was um, some requests for the commentary on that. Um, and yeah, perhaps you could share uh, your opinion on how that's gonna be, how that needs to be managed um, for the European solutions. No, I think we just got the second part of the question. Um, oh yes, indeed. How big's the competitive disadvantage of EU companies due to the due to this regard to LLMs and to what degree can we get something working maybe Kubernetes based within this reality uh, in the EU? So, I mean, I don't think that this innovation only happens in the US. Um, if there is a sufficient, I mean, there's, there's close to half a billion people in Europe. Um, and that, that's more than enough of a market for, for companies to say, okay, let's, let's create a similar offering in Europe if that is, if it's worth it, if there's a uh, like commercial value in this. But maybe, um, I'll, I'll not go on to the European level, but I do think there is a huge value in creating a product that 
is almost like a document QA in a box where you commoditize it to a degree where a small or medium enterprise can just take one of their virtual machines or their virtual appliances and then install it as a web interface and then you load a whole bunch of files in there. You just drop them all into a folder on, on, on the Windows file system or on a Linux server. And then you have this document QA in a box. I think that is something that is super democratizing and I wouldn't be surprised if that comes out in, uh, not too long from now. And that would resolve a lot of these arguments of I don't want to send data to wherever. It could be US, could be China, could be Europe, could be the cloud, it could be to my competitor. Yeah. Thank you, Bosco. So yeah, I believe um, we're at time. Any final thoughts, remarks, comments? Um, I would say it's super exciting at the moment. And I think there's a lot of interesting things coming up around the reduction of the cost for training and inference, um, additional open models coming out, hopefully the whole reinforcement learning agents on top of it, um, distillation of models and also structured data augmentation plus uh, action transformers. So I think it's going to be an exciting 2023. Yeah, from my side, I feel like we should not forget that this is a technology that in theory should make our lives easier and better. So this is, I, I keep thinking about this. How can we do less of everything and not more now that we have Gen AI? How can we do, we do less emails, less reading articles, less just trying to stay on top of everything and just doing a little bit more of the things that we actually want to do? So I think that's just a reflection that keeps coming to my head. I think it's a very beautiful place to end. Thank you both. And yeah, thanks everyone for listening and for your wonderful questions. Mm -hmm.